Good afternoon. Welcome to EduSat Network. Friend, as you know, we have organized two lectures on science and technology and historical perspectives. As you know, we, uh, science and technology has, Im has improved so, so much in, uh, over the years and uh, it has a very important dimension and how it has evolved. Today we will see uh, the whole development of the science and technology and for discussion on this very topic we have in the studio Dr. Deepak Kumar. He is a renowned educationist and teaches in uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. So I hope his uh, knowledge and experience will help us to understand the science and technology uh, in a new perspective. So on your behalf, I welcome Dr. Kumar for EduSat lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, well, as we all know that uh, modern age, modern times is an age driven by new tools, techniques, new ideas, new institutions and so forth. <clears throat> However, this doesn't mean that Indian society didn't have appropriate techniques, tools or scientific ideas, rational ideas in earlier times, in ancient times, in medieval times. Indian society had always been a thinking society. All our requirements were met according to the then available resources and our thought processes. Uh, <clears throat> however, it was during 16th, 17th centuries that certain part of the world especially Western Europe, developed certain new ideas which we come to know as you know, we, we call them a scientific revolution of 17th century, which also led to the development of what we call 18th century industrial revolution, new tools, techniques, they came up and along with these developments those countries which were able to achieve these could gradually develop into huge maritime powers and that is how the process of colonization began. Almost 80% of the world was colonized by these countries like England, Holland, Portugal, Spain who had mastered new tools, new techniques and who were able to produce a number of thinkers who could give new ideas, new dimensions to our, new explanations to our existence. So science, colonization, society, all these marched together. Our society, Indian society, <coughs> during 17th century couldn't match these advances for whatever be the reasons we didn't feel the need we were happy creating our own Taj Mahal we were we had a, a wonderful uh, tradition uh, in terms of textile in terms of iron making you know the Kutub iron pillar is a marvelous example of our metallurgical skill uh, we had our own perceptions about our body, our uh, 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 ailments, etc. We had astronomical advances which were absolutely unparalleled. We have heard of, we know about Aryabhata, Brahmagupta, Bhaskara, many more. The way we advanced knowledge <coughs> was slightly different from the way Western Europe advanced knowledge. We advanced knowledge through writing commentaries, through incremental addition to the existing repertoire of knowledge and the society moved gradually, slowly 
and another important very impo in, 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 uh, interesting feature is that our society had never been a xenophobic society we always accepted ideas coming from different parts of the world and our ideas also traveled to them so in early medieval times medieval times you see that we received and we gave to others also whatever knowledge we had been able to generate and disseminate in 18th century however we came to be enslaved by european powers not only because they had superior musketry or they were militarily powerful but also because their society represented new skills and new knowledge so india was defeated at different uh, 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 battlefields like palasi baksar etc these were not ordinary battles in fact we had already lost the intellectual battle couple of decades or centuries before palasi happens however when colonization became fait accompli indian society tried to take the best advantage out of this situation so you have in late 18th century early 19th century mid 19th century number of people who were trying to incorporate the new ideas which had come as part of the colonial baggage so you have raja ram mohan rai asking for uh, reforms asking for new knowledge you have many more whole of 19th century is full of several cultural and social reformers who wanted new scientific ideas new tools and technologies to be incorporated in indian life right from raja ram mohan roy in early 19th century to swami vivekananda in the late 19th century you see a large number of such people trying to take advantage of the colonial situation and trying to take advantage of and trying to make india modern in its outlook in both its spiritual as well as material conditions uh, by the end of 19th century and in early 20th century <clears throat> you will come across a number of institutions which had already been established a number of professional societies which had been established a number of conferences and meetings which were held the result of these activities spanning almost the whole of 19th century <clears throat> india could produce a middle class a vibrant middle class which thought in along modern lines which talked in terms of new knowledge modern science and new tools and techniques these ideas didn't come in in um, uh, um, uh, in in vacuum they were housed in different institutions which the british government in india had established for example way back in 1835 calcutta medical college was established 1847 we have an engineering college at roorkee then shipur bengal many other places you know establishment of universities in 1857 calcutta madras bombay these presidency towns <coughs> in number of areas like medic medicine public health uh, geological op operations geometrical operations 
botanical operations, agricultural improvement, etc., you will see that these institutions were going to play a remarkable role. And thereby, India had virtually entered a modern age. New institutions, new ideas, and comparatively, relatively new tools. So, science and technology came to be associated with Indian ethos. There were some people that there still are who argue that India had been a spiritual society and India, you know, had little, was stagnant, had little patience for new ideas. India had lived like almost village republic and so forth. But the truth is that whenever appropriate technologies were presented to the illiterate, even illiterate Indian patients, they accepted it. They accepted new seed, they accepted new types of plows, new types of machines, if they, it helped them produce more. <clears throat> Early 20th century saw the efflorescence of these activities, not only in terms of material development and exploitation of natural resources, which of course was done with a view to serve the colonial interests and the interests of the British Empire. Along with that, a group of Indians emerged who could produce original ideas, original scientific ideas, and could compete with their Europeans and American counterpart in terms of generating fundamental research. So you have Jagdish Chandra Bose at the turn of the 20th century, the works, the remarkable works. You have Dr. Satin Bose, <coughs> who collaborated with Einstein, the famous equation, Boson e equation. You have Professor Meghnath Saha, who is known as the father of modern astrophysics. <coughs> you have Prafulla Chandra Ray, who uh, was not only a very renowned chemist, but a very socially committed person and a, a remarkable teacher. So, number of people you will find during this period uh, uh, of, say, 1880 to 1945, till colonization lasted, till our independence, who were trying to give India a, an identity in the scientific world, an identity of their own, as not only users or consumers of new knowledge, but as producers of new knowledge. This was something very significant, very, very different. New institutions were established by some of the Indians without the government help. A, a, a um, institution called Indian Association for Cultivation of Science was established in Calcutta as early as 1876 by a doctor called Dr. Mahindralal Sarkar. He established this institution through donations. I consider the establishment of this institution no less important than the establishment of Indian National Congress itself 10 years later. Establishment of the Indian Association of Cultivation of Science was a cultural response as the establishment of the Indian National Congress was a political response to the establishment of British rule. And we, we need to keep in mind that this quest for identity, the development of national feelings, the gradual development of national movement, all these moved together. Our scientifically educated people, they played an enormous role in bringing about this change. I would not call it a scientific renaissance, but Definitely, it was something which this, the Indian society had never witnessed before. It was absolutely remarkable experience. Right from 1876 to the period of independence 1947, so many changes took place in the realm of ideas, in the realm of 
the way Indian society looked at itself and the world at large. The way our political leaders discussed the role of new tools, technologies, scientific ideas in reconstruction of the country, in developing India. Right from the First World War onward, numerous pamphlets and books were written on how to reconstruct the country. Independence was looming large. People were asking for it and they knew that very soon independence would arrive in a couple of decades, if not in few years. Therefore, they started to think about, to feel about what new India would look like, how to reconstruct the country, what role science and technology play in this phase of transition and later on in the reconstruction of the country. All this was, was being discussed and you have numerous contributors to this debate. Right from Mahindra Lal Sarkar in 1870s down to Meghnath Saha in 1940s. You have these scientifically trained scientific people thinking about Indian society. India was not left to the politicians alone, no, or to social reformers alone. Of course, social reform has always been our agenda and many people contributed it to it from Jyoti Bapule to B. R. Ambedkar and many more. Political leadership right from Tada Bhai Noroji to Gandhi and Nehru. Cultural leadership which Vivekananda and Tagore provided, Rabindranath Tagore provided. Along with these happenings and very valuable leadership guidance which we received, we also received extremely important scientific leadership from Mahindra Lal Sarkar onward. We need to recapitulate their ideas. As we have entered into 21st century, we need to remember them. What did they say? We need to learn lessons from their experiences. What did they expect from Indian society? How did they try to modernize the Indian society? And gradually they succeeded in creating at least in laying the foundation of sto stone of what our own contemporary free India is today all about. Uh, can I take a break? break uh, I will ask a question. Some. I, I ask you a question. We will. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, this was, as you say, the social reformer and the political. This social reformer alone and political reformer alone was. Not the case, but the thing was going on at all level, all levels. So, do you think uh, that if we have given an impetus to society to make a reform more, and then a political movement, a technological movement have started, then the course of the history would have been different? Uh, this is a very interesting uh, question. You know, Indian society uh, has been a very old, uh, very complex and at the same time exceptionally cult culturally exceptionally rich society. You know, you can have what you have in mind in areas like North America or Australia which were mostly tabula rasa, clean slates. Right. We have never been a clean slate for thousands of years of very dense history we have. Now in a dense history what happens? life becomes much more complex. When history is dense, life becomes complex. That is why our society produced more social reformers and thinkers right from the days of Shankaracharya onward. So we have Kabir, we have Chaitanya, we have Meera, lots of people. But the question is asked, 
why we didn't produce a Galileo in place of Kabir or Leonardo da Vinci. Right. Now, this was because, uh, you know, uh, our society felt the need of social reform more than material improvement or material development. In tropical climate, everything grew in our backyard. All our requirements were locally met. We didn't feel that need in many ways. Moreover, we are obsessed with aesthetics. We created Taj Mahal. We built huge stone architectures, but we didn't think about glass. That was a mistake. Glass, as you know, is physics, is optics. It is because of glass that this ubiquitous mobile chip works. Is mobile chip or your all computer or satellite, everything is an extension of glass technology. With marble mastery, we couldn't have done that. Now, a society that plays with marble has definitely paid a price for being little backward. We couldn't keep pace with uh, the Europeans because they developed, they played with glass, right. not only with marble. They, they realized the significance of optics and thereby there was nothing could stop them. They developed microscope, they developed telescope and we all know what it means to modernity. Uh, the other argument is in India, we had like, uh, we, uh, made, as you mentioned that we made Taj and other things. But there was a saying, there was an argument that India was not uh, uh, building the huge houses because that they were more of eco-friendly. Uh, it was like of uh, uh, mud, it was thatched roof. It's because if it uh, collapses, it will uh, mix up with the other elements. So how do you justify your argument just you said that? <coughs> You know, uh, uh, what you are hinting it is that because of the environment and the climate, our people developed lifestyle accordingly. Right. Fine. But I am not an environmental determinist. Sorry. Environment doesn't determine everything. A human being can, I mean thinking, human thinking can definitely go beyond the limitations of environment and many things. I mean, this, 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 a tropical climate shouldn't have stopped us uh, from, from producing a, a Copernicus. I mean, Copernicus is product not of a alpine climate. No, sure. he is a product of because certain different ideas had come up. Challenging established notions, reformation, renaissance, etc. In our place, we seldom try to challenge established notions. That was our mistake. That is true. You are uh, uh, focusing on the physical world, but when we come in the uh, field of medicine, we find uh, uh, when we consider the last uh, decade uh, uh, research, we find we were much ahead of them. Last, uh, uh, this decade we can say, the started with 2002-2010, the analysis research went on comparison of Ayurveda, Yunani and other in, uh, system of medicines. So then we find that the Ayurveda was much ahead of that. So in the field of medicine we were much ahead. So we were having here the scientists who had scientific temperament uh, more uh, in comparison with the Copernicus, Galileo or others. And one more example I will give then I will ask the question. Uh, the example is we have a Khagol, a place in a Bihar. I know. We are the Taregana. Uh, yeah, Taregana. The name of the place is this. And this, uh, when we uh, 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 study the solar eclipse, other, we find the same kind of measurement. And this was done a thousands of years back. How do you explain this on your the, uh, argument which you were just uh, citing? <coughs> you know, as I said, our society has been very rich. No doubt about that it. That is true, but we didn't produce Galileo and Copernicus, no, what no, you said, no, no, where no, we are. No, no, that, 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 it, it is not that easy, you know. Explanations cannot be, uh, it has to take several factors into account. Our civilization had been reached, no doubt, at least in three terms, in health, in astronomy and in mathematics. Right. Very strong tradition. But at the same time, as I argued earlier, we developed some sort of what you call canonical knowledge. When knowledge becomes canonized, Shastra Sammat, then gradually people began to have so much respect for it that they would not try to question it. 
So along with Aryabhatta and Brahmagupta, you have the Puranas which are saying no, eclipses are caused by Rahu and Ketu. Poor Brahmagupta who knew that this is done through because of shadow of some falling on the other, still he retraces his steps, says no Puranas couldn't be wrong. You know, because this is the dialectic relationship between tradition and traditional knowledge, canonized knowledge and, and, science. and new knowledge. So there would be a clash and people tend to withdraw. This is what happened till Jai Singh. Look at Jai Singh. He is a great man, absolute remarkable scholar of uh, uh, late uh, uh, 17th, early 18th century. You have his Jantar Mantar here. Yeah. What did, did, do they signify? Jantar not Mantar gives you the accurate results. But he was not aware of the Copernican revolution. He remained geocentric in his approach. He, was, he remained true to the Siddhantas and to the Indo-Islamic Ziz Parampara or the Almanic uh, tradition which he had inherited. Means you are saying that if you have higher knowledge, you should also have knowledge what the lower knowledge is going somewhere else. You want to need, you need, uh, you know, you need to transcend your cultural barriers to go ahead. That is true. But see, as you uh, mentioned that Jai Singh, uh, not in only Delhi, uh, there are five other five other observatories. Five other observatory we have in India. So and they were much advanced uh, in technology and in prediction compared to the uh, compared to then uh, Western world. Uh, no, no, they were not. They compared no, to the, then. No, no. Uh, the we, truth is no, because when in Jai Singh's time, Jai Singh is creating Masonic Jantar Mantar. These Jandarbandars are huge, you know, you cannot transport them from one place to another place. At the same time, Galileo is, has already was using a telescope. In fact, Jai Singh was also given a telescope by, it is said, by some of the Jesuit fathers. When Jesuit fathers were visiting India, they came with crude microscope and telescopes in their, in their uh, jola, uh, along with Bible. So Jai, Jai Singh should have known that. Unfortunately, he missed it because we were obsessed with our own ways of thinking and instruments. We didn't shift to the glass. That was the mistake. That's why Jai Singh looks medieval in his outlook, though he lived in virtual modern times. Okay. Had he been too able to do that, then he would have been the father of modern India, not Ram Mohan Rai. Right. Even a century before, he would have been the father. Now, his Jantar Mantar, you cannot carry home. Like a you, telescope you can carry home. Like you want to get across the point is we were ahead in the iron revolution in 300 uh, BC. BC yeah. uh, but we have not been ahead in the glass revolution where we missed the bus. We missed the bus. We used to to, to create bangles. Hazar saal pehle bhi. Thousand years ago we were, we used glass. Glass we were aware of. But we just didn't move further ahead to grind glasses. Use of spectacles. We never used the spectacles. For the first time, it was given to to uh, Jahagir by Jesuit fathers. But the thing is, we didn't, surma lagate the. But we didn't need that thing. No, no, of course you needed it. Of course, as you need today, our forefathers also needed it. But the, the problem was they were not aware of the new tool. So what they would do, they would put some surma, some sort of thing, or you know. I mean, who doesn't, I mean, today, thanks to microscope, you know, it is the age of biotechnology. So you go for blood test and all sorts of tests and MRI and so forth. Once you have the tools, then you go for such diagnosis. When these tools were not available, they said, okay, eat Chavan Prash, feel happy, your cup will be gone. Fine, I am not obsessed with the, our old tradition, but what the point I want to come to know from your mouse, because you have the uh, uh, privilege of studying, doing research and all these issues. Uh, recently, somebody told me that uh, uh, like now, you see, we, when we have tooth, pro, uh, tooth problem, we go to the dentist, see it, and then they get, get extracted. But the person, other person said that in the old time, what would, uh, even ra uh, right now, we have in Delhi, they just move the uh, finger like this and the teeth come, uh, come out. How the uh, scientist and the historian will explain this? That is, we call it folk knowledge, which is very important. Knowledge is a huge thing. Under this canopy, many things come. Even something which appears as superstition to us comes under part of that knowledge capacity. But there is difference between Jnana and Vijnana. Right. Under Jnana, many things come. Puranas also come under Jnana. Everything comes under Jnana. But Vijnana is distilled Jnana. 
it undergoes certain processes once you passes that process then it becomes distilled knowledge refined knowledge refined knowledge probably we gradually develop in 18th 19th 20th century earlier also we had in many ways defined refined knowledge okay. you know we had our hakimis we had our ibn sina al kanun we have charak sushurta we have the nighantus lots of things but we should not confuse gyana with vigyana vigyana is always progressing moving forward okay we will discuss much more about this and if you want to say something then you can start del your lecture again on some aspects uh, okay. particular aspects okay you want to communicate okay okay <coughs> the major things what we find the confusion in science and technology how an historian can see science in an one perspective and the technology in another perspective you know uh, uh, we should not take science and technology as two different entities they are actually two sides of the same coin human beings the way the day way we developed into homo sapiens we became homo favorals fabricating so we are not only thinking people but at the same time we are tool makers right from the the way we evolved human beings evolved so therefore science and technology are basically two sides of the same coin of course people have talked more in terms of you know technology affecting material life material culture etc while science was given a status where where Uh, uh in the realm of ideas in the realm of thinking etc but no tool can can come without a thinking process even this terminal this computer this mobile all this has behind it thousands and th- hun- hundreds years of research of previous paradigm of knowledge all this have contributed to it so so ideas and tools both go together science and technology should never be confused as distinct things be it uh, uh, in terms of a, 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 a an instrument or be it in terms of idea they are together and they are closely linked and therefore and, and another th- uh, point which i would like to make is that they are not divine creations no in science and technology you don't have revelation it is only i mean in, in theology buddha gets revelation the prophet gets revelation and comes out with something which people millions follow in their life in their society etc etc but in science and technology you don't have revelation napoleon did in <laughs> napoleon sorry newton didn't come across this um, uh, gravitational uh, knowledge because of an apple falling no this was because of certain incremental knowledge which he had already acquired so so gradually uh, um, uh, science and technology one has to realize are basically socially influenced and to a large extent socially constructed because it is the society as you said you know that uh, necessity is the mother of invention as you feel the necessity inventions keep coming keeps coming yes. innovations keep coming okay as a historian have you uh, noticed <coughs> the stream different streams in the development of science and technology yes yes you know <coughs> knowledge earlier was holistic vedas by definition they mean knowledge and gradually ayurveda develops at the fifth veda in shamveda there is a lot of scientific knowledge incantations people thought those days thought in terms of mantras fine this is how they looked at it later on gradually you will see that in several sanghitas and the brahmanas very thoughtful questions were being asked about the nature of cosmos nature of reality the term brahma means basically reality truth upanishads very deep philosophical philosophy of science will find there panini's grammar uh, kanad's uh, anuvad 
and numerous examples where you will see that very fine mind where trying to look into the mysteries of nature and our the purpose of our existence and so forth so all our knowledge had been you know oriented towards knowing that truth so i mean and and many places people it was said i mean the famous nachiketa uh, 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 story where you know the it is said neti neti neither this nor this so you keep on falsifying much later in 20th century popper talks about how knowledge moves by falsifying the existing theories so we have been we have been in at the forefront of knowledge no doubt about it uh, in old times uh, we were not a xenophobic society also we received knowledge we gave knowledge and so forth and therefore the only thing the only problem comes when in medieval times and late medieval time we were unable to for some reason or the other for certain historic reasons we were unable to keep pace with the changes which took place in certain parts of the world that is western europe and therefore we gradually came we went down and we were enslaved for two centuries we were slaves if we had all the knowledge then why didn't we well, why did we become gulab why this colonization took place why whole of africa asia was colonized you have ottoman empire you have manchus you have moguls you have safavids in iran all great four empires in the same time they started crumbling in 18th century and they came to be replaced by tiny nations like portugal holland england etc these are the seafaring nations and this time attack comes not through khyber but through new route about which we knew very little so was it because of the science and technology obviously because of technology because of compass because of gunpowder because of their knowledge east india company ships represented new knowledge columbus was not an individual when he landed in americas he was not an individual he was not only a, a freebooter he represented a whole system a new society had they been so powerful he had the strength derived from the science and technology why there was a need to uh, come up with a kind of conspiracy a strategy of divide and rule and the other things if the, they are derived a strength from the <coughs> technology they are these strategies uh, were part of their establishing their rule in the country but see if i am uh, a powerful man i can trust anybody if we have so much confidence on uh, myself why will need a conspiracy you know, sort of it thing? happened because india was a huge country and indian society was not like maoris in new zealand or not like the red indians in americas red indians were very small number so they could be physically annihilated they could be killed but indians with 30 crore population they couldn't have been annihilated so first capture them through their superior knowledge and thereafter gradually try to foment trouble within their own society and keep them under control so all these strategies which you find of statecraft which they utilize it later gradually is uh, is uh, to keep control and we also took advantage of that and we turned the table on them so our national movement was basically a reply to them paid to them in their own coin you are not giving us democracy you talk of democracy in your country you are not giving us you talk of material development new technologies and science in your country why don't you give it to us ramon roy asset even nehru asked it everybody so uh, so uh, we also tried the similar strategies it is not that we left them once we felt empowered you know i would uh, i would uh, uh, take your uh, draw your attention to the interesting you know work shakespeare uh, he is at the beginning of colonization the periods early 17th century uh, he wrote tempest and in tempest you have three characters and there is a famous shipwreck the character which is the most powerful is called prospero he is prosperous because he has a magic wand in his hand what is magic wand that's the knowledge science and technology with that he establishes his rule in the area there is another character called ariel they come to support he comes to support him prospero becomes his lackey 
So this is the collaborator class, Badralok. Right. And, they, but still, there is another character which is very powerful, which is the, the basically the slave, Caliban. And the Caliba doesn't get subdued all the time. You know, he gets flashes of anger. So there are revolts also many times. In fact, in fact, at on one point, Caliba tries to rape Miranda, daughter of uh, 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 Prospero. Prospero. Prospero curses him, saying, "Look, I tried to improve you, but you are." not worth improvement. You never improve. You remain what you are. You are a slave or a shudra or whatever you are. The, the words. So you will remain that. So I curse you. Then Kalima shots back. He says, I can also curse you because now you have taught me the language. This is what Indian nationalism was. Shot back. We are still trying to, to give them the reply. Aren't we? Even in 21st century, aren't we accepting the new tools and technologies which are manufactured elsewhere in MIT and we master them and thereafter we tell them, no, my economy is growing faster and without us you cannot run the planet. I have a share in the planet. You cannot go for climate control and all sorts of legislation, WTO or etc. without our participation. America cannot do anything now alone, nor can China, nor India. All We have become interdependent, globalized, truly, thanks to these revolutionary changes which have taken place in the realm of science and technology during the last hundred years or so. Do you think that pre present problem of Egypt and America can be explained through this uh, argument also? Oh yes, why not? Because it leads to it, it is because of um, uh, the communication revolution. A day before, I was reading in the newspaper, in the yeah, newspaper that thanks to Al Jazeera, television channel, that uh, the Tunisian revolt uh, was immediately broadcast, and uh, the so-called they call it Jasmine Revolution. Tunisia, uh, is, Tunisia, Jordan. Uh, yeah, yeah, it has gone to different places, and you know we are no longer isolated islands thanks to these connectivities and it affects us. What is happening in Egypt is affecting me. All of us, it is, it is affecting us. So we are all concerned about it. And definitely, uh, you know, you know, uh, this can be explained in terms of uh, uh, our new uh, empowerment, which technology has given us, which science has given us, which new ways of thinking has given us. I'm no longer an island. I may have come, my forefathers may have come from one particular part in Bihar or somewhere. They may not, they may, or those days, century ago, they may not have thought about where the, where Cairo is. But today I am more concerned than my great-grandfather about whatever happens elsewhere. Because it's going to affect me. It's going to affect my economy. Whatever happens in any part of the world. So, Science and technology, as you said, plays a very important role. What are the, you say, uh, milestones which have changed the course of history? <coughs> yeah, there are many. Though I do not believe in milestones personally, I believe that history is a running, running stream. Some mighty Ganges. Many rivulets have contributed to it and the flow keeps on going. But still, if you insist, then of course, uh, uh, in, in modern times at least, we can mention two great changes which took place in our thought processes. One was definitely Darwinian revolution. 150 years ago, exactly, Darwinian revolution and at the same time another change which took place was Pasteurian revolution, which today has given birth to what you call biotechnology and 21st century is being rated as the age of biology and so forth. It is the, the foundation was laid in Pasteurian revolution the germ theory of disease, the use of germs for it. 
you know, this brings me to a very interesting account. In 1680, there was a person in Leiden, city of Leiden in Holland, who used to ground, grind glasses in his spare time. His name was Lee Van Hoek. Grinding glass in his spare time, he looked at rainwater. Once he looked at it, he was surprised that at a particular level of ground glass, he saw things were moving, there was life. Life is all about movement and motor. He immediately was struck. Then he goes back home, feels that you know his urine is also a type of water, looks at it, finds there also something moving. Thereafter, he wrote, he thought about it, he experimented on it, and found that there is life outside, body, inside body, which could not be seen through naked eyes. He writes a letter to the Royal Society London in 1688 or so, saying that I have sighted a whole new world, which cannot be seen through naked eyes. And they are live in millions and billions. We had missed this sight, Drishti. In our Virat Swarupa Darshan, Kavi Vyasa could multiply one sun with a thousand sun, thousand moon, and show in Srimad Bhagavat that Paramatma had all these suns and moons inside him. But nobody could spot a microbe. Today we know what significant role microbe plays in our life. Inside our body, outside our body. We are all aware of its significance. And it's thanks to the grinding glass business, which took place somewhere. And how he wrote, I have sighted a whole new world. When I read this in the archive of Royal Society, I had good bumps. I felt, look, this fellow is claiming of a new sight, sighting a whole new world. It was more important than, than, than uh, Columbus or Vasco de Gama, sighting new territories. Isn't it? We couldn't produce a Liban hope. But I don't, I don't blame the society for this, no. This happened because certain things happened because they lay in the logic of history. You can't control history. You can't control these milestones. Why Louis Pasteur is not born in Patna? Why he is born in Paris? I mean, this would be an absurd question to me. This would be an absurd question. Why Arya Bhatta is born in, works in Khagol, in Patna, why he is not born in Egypt? I mean, these are, these are, these, this is, this is not really the lesson we draw from history. The lesson we draw from history that certain things happen because of certain given conditions. Even great thoughts occur because of certain conditions given to them. In the absence of those conditions, these things cannot happen. Prapulla Chandra Ray gives a very interesting example in his history of Hindu chemistry. He said in India this didn't take place because of the strong caste system which we practiced. There was disjunction between mind and the fingers. People who worked with the fingers, they were put on the margins of the society, outside the village. Our Kumhars, Badis, Luhars, etc. The Garvagra was controlled by some people who thought that they were the only thinking people. And their knowledge system remained engrossed with paravidya, with knowledge which was superior, spiritual knowledge, which they considered to be superior. Apara was neglected. This happened in Islamic society also. Ilme dunya, though there is a lot of emphasis on Islam on ilm, but there is ilme dunya, ilme adhya. There is makul, there is mankul. Makul is what appeals to reason. Mankul is which is theological. So in Islamic knowledge you will see lot of emphasis on jurisprudence, on how to control your life, how to regulate your life, society, etc. All sorts of things. So theology and, and jurisprudence. But not on rationality. Gradually it went down. That's the reason especially post-Ghazali Islam. But before Ghazali, you have brilliant people. Ibn Sina, Ibn Haytham. Ibn Haytham worked on optics much before Newton. 
he understood the significance of, of light. Unfortunately, in our system, light was considered something like Noor, Rohani. We didn't look into its physical properties. There is difference between if, how a physicist will look at light and a, a spiritual leader in, in all those channels, star type channels, they will look at it. For them it is Noor, Rohani. For others light is physical and we all know what light means to us. This is what Einstein wanted to ride on a beam of light. And look at the remarkable... So, th this is the difference which we, I was talking about. And this is where, these were the milestones which we missed. We missed the milestone of uh, Darwinian evolution, we missed the milestone Pasturian, we missed the milestone in, um, in terms of uh, <coughs> Einstein, uh, quantum mechanics, etc. etc. But the, as you said, the quantum mechanics, we find the origin of quantum mechanics, we have to compare to origin in our, uh, uh, say, Indian tradition of knowledge, they find somewhere to the philosoph some philosophy, which six uh, school oh, of yes. philosophy, one oh, yes. school of oh, yes. philosophy, Charvak and others. No, you know, if you look into Indian philosophical tradition, it has been so rich that you will find seeds of many things which is happening today, today into that. But of course you can't put Rutherford in Kanad Zanuad. That would be too much. Uh, when uh, when uh, this uh, Darwinian uh, news came to India, there were people who argued, even Bankim Chandra himself, the great laureate, he argued, oh, Darwinism, Darwin confirms Indian theory of evolution. After all, we have Dashavatara. Life moves here from aquatic form, Matasya avatara, to Krishna avatara. So all these lower forms of life, upward we have been moving in the avatara. So that proves that, you know, Darwinism we were. And we didn't mind it because, you know, we are, we, we worship uh, Hanuman. Therefore, if you are, if you have emerged out of apes, it didn't bother us. Fine. But however, yeah, I mean, it would be too much to take Darwinism to the avatara only. Darwinism is more than the Shavatara, isn't it? So that credit we have to give. Seeds you will always find. Because our thought processes was very, very rich, very comprehensive. Cosmos, cosmology was unique. Both Indo-Islamic cosmology. Islam when it came, it also enriched us in many ways. Enormous enrichment. But it would not be proper for us to trace all these things into there. I mean, some of the principles on which your computer works might be similar to Panini's grammar. But that doesn't make, you know, this invention, you know, I mean, you can't, you, you know, you have to draw a line somewhere. You have to put light on yourself. There is nothing wrong in self-criticism. There is absolutely, uh, what is the point in self-glorification all the time? If you had everything, fine, then nothing can move further. I give you one another interesting example. <coughs> uh, 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 this great man, Professor Meghnath Shah, he worked on uh, thermal ionization. And he got big name in 1920s. He went to Dhaka. Uh, there people came to see him. Oh, you have a big name now. You have done something very fundamental. A, a barrister came to see him and asked him, please explain to me in general terms what this thermal ionization is and what your contribution to modern knowledge, physics is. Then he tried to explain it to him. Meghna Shah, the barrister was not convinced. After 15 minutes he said, okay, Meghna, what you have said is already there in the Vedas. Then he explained again. After half an hour, the barrister was not convinced. He said, no, this is in the Vedas. After 45 minutes of explanation more, Meghnath Sahasa said, please sir, this is different. What I'm talking is nobody has talked tell. No, no, it must be in the Vedas. Then Meghnath Sahasa said, okay, tell me where in the Vedas all these are. 
He said, no, you look, you read the Veda, then you will know it. So whatever you are Then Meghna said, okay, jab sabai Vede ache. if everything is in the Vedas, then I am irrelevant. I have no... I mean, this is type of an argument which uh, Bakhtiar Khalji took when he said everything is in the Holy Quran, therefore Nalanda doesn't need to exist. And he burnt it. Alexandria was burnt because of such people and such notions. If everything was there, then fine. Then no, you know, further argument cannot take place. If all the knowledge in the seed form is in one holy book, then, then nothing can be done. Then you live with that. I have no problem with it. You live with that holy book. You die with it. Whatever you do, nothing, no one can argue with you because then you have closed your windows. That, yeah. that is the main difference between, I would say, post-colonial India, during colonial India, that India uh, went on just having faith on that and the Western world derived inspiration and the cue from there and went on for further research. You know, you have used this very interesting term, post-colonial. I don't want to go into the greater details because these post-colonial things, sometimes they confuse me also. <coughs> and uh, they are very good so far as in terms of literature is concerned, literary understanding is concerned and so forth. But uh, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, I'm not debunking my past, no. But at the same time, I do not believe in excessive romanticization. Most of our post-colonial critics are doing exactly this. This I would not buy. I would like that, <coughs> like Gandhi, that our window should be open, door should be open, and I would not shirk from criticizing my own self, my own culture, if I have valid grounds. And if I have the requisite data and the proof. In the absence of proper proof, there is no point saying that I had Pushpak Viman. <coughs> I had every knowledge. I had all the Prachay Patastras. Okay, fine, you had. By giving your Prachay Patastra ancient names, Brahmos, etc. I mean, it doesn't serve that purpose. Or giving, calling it Hatf or Gori. I mean, serves other purposes than those of science. Nehru wouldn't have done that. Nehru, that is why he talked of scientific temper. He even differed with Gandhi. Meghnath Shah wouldn't have done that. Many more, they wouldn't have done it. Baba wouldn't have done it. They talked of scientific temper. Most of the institutions we live in, and most of the institutions you represent, are products of this quest for scientific temper, rationality. I'm not saying that all canonical knowledge are wrong. No. Even Sayyid Ahmad didn't say this. Sayyid Ahmad, the late 19th century reformer, educationist, he said, okay, Quran has a, the Holy Quran is very important. But don't look for scientific things in the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran is meant for certain social and personal purposes. Not for explanation of cosmo, cos, cosmic things. This is what scientific tempa means. This is what Nehru asked for. This is what society needs to. If we go with open mind and bring science society together with a very rational attitude in our curriculum, in our teaching, in our writing, in our mass media, communication, etc., then the society will grow further. So, uh, well, friend, Thank today you. we have had enough discussion on the topic science and technology, as a, uh, how we can do a study science and technology and what we seek from our traditional knowledge and what a scientific temper in, uh, uh, we should purchase for the uh, prosperity and for the uh, furtherance of the society or furtherance of the our uh, progress of, of our culture and many things. And as Dr. Deepak Kumar uh, suggested that scientific temper is different from the
traditional knowledge. So we should keeping this in the mind. We will to do, tomorrow we'll have another discussion on this very topic, science and technology and historical perspective. We will try to find out all the things. So with this word, we conclude the lecture here, and I thank all of you for watching the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.